reconstruction and a replacement is undertaken. Coming to the distal, distal end of the humerus, what is again is important whether you put a 90 degree plate or a parallel plate, what is important is to bring about anatom anatomical position. And this is the functional position. Wherever necessary, you can, you can, you can undertake a electron and osteotomy and bring about anato anatomical reposition of the fragment. This end of the radius is many times a challenge. If it is not much displaced, you can, you can, you can undertake, undertake a K-wire fixation or external fixator or even a simple buttress plate of this nature. Whereas if it is a C3 fracture of this nature, of course, you can use two I am sorry. Oh, it is. Sir. What happened? Yeah. We are coming to the head of the radius. Bucket is no place for the head of the radius today. As far as possible, masons two, even up to three, you can you can reduce the fractured fragments back into position and reduce it as far as possible anatomically and bring about anatomical position of the fragment. And as you see, a simple Herbert screw has made the difference. Whereas in complex fractures of the elbow of this nature, with the tire at the, where the head of the radius has to be replaced and a reconstruction of the olecranon with a ligament complex has to be undertaken. Here is a very complex injury with shaft to the humerus, shaft to the both bones of the forearm, interarticular fracture, distal and interarticular fracture of the distal radius. And uh, all these fractures were, were fixed. And this is the picture to the, you see the distal end of the humerus and the distal end of the radius. And this is a six months post op where the articular surface is very well maintained, the fracture is almost united. And this is the functional position of this particular patient with multiple fracture. The proximal humerus, this was 10 years ago, we used to, all of us used to use butter plates, this, he has done well. And uh, the, this, but what you see is there is still a virus. Whereas today we have from LPHP, this was an LPHP used with a posterior dislocation, fracture dislocation of the shoulder. This was done nearly 10 years ago, but today with all these, uh, the pillows plate, it has made a difference to bring about anatomical position and reconstruction of the fragment as such. And this is the functional position. Finally, gentlemen, if, if you cannot, Dr. Dean Dial has already mentioned about the solid procedure. And with an interarticular fracture where nothing can be done, of course, the solid procedure of the, this was a patient which was shattered into pieces and a salvaging procedure has to be undertaken as you see here. What is important is the function of the patient and this is the final picture of this particular patient. Of course, the post-operative rehabilitation is most vital and active assisted exercises from day one and CPM. However, CPM does not prevent muscular atrophy as all of us know. Coming to the emerging technologies in the treatment of intraarticular fractures. The T1 and RHO MRI mapping, this measures relaxation times in cartilage, can assess specific components of articular cartilage, biochemistry and ultra structures. More specific than conventional MRI in cartilage degradation. And virtual operative planning can be undertaken today, including implants, preoperatively with electronic templating, so that you will know what to do and what not to do for an intraarticular fracture. Navigation CT based, uh, CT based or fluoroscopy based can be undertaken. Nanotechnology and chondrocyte transplantation are making newer inroads in the management of complications of intraarticular fractures. Sir, could you Finally, you gentlemen, basic mechanical aspects in internal fixation of fractures can never be eclipsed by newer fixation devices. However, good and however anatomical plates have come into work in treatment of intraarticular fractures taking care of the soft tissues, surgeon should be, I emphasize, should be a gardener and not a carpenter. To conclude, anatomical reduction and absolute stability are vital pillars for optimum healing of articular fractures. Immobilization of interarticular fractures leads to stiffness. Immobilization after fixation of interarticular fractures leads to more stiffness. You cannot reduce depressed impacted articular fragments by close reduction. Any metaphysial or diaphysial fragment should be reduced, bone grafting, bone grafted if necessary. Always restore joint congregity and axial and rotational alignment. Early motion 
and stable fixation are the key for success in intra-articular fractures. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Professor Shetty. I now invite Dr. N.C. Mahapatra. And before that, I want to give you a message that Dr. Tamna will be coming in the next session, please. Uh, Dr. N.C. Mahapatra, working as an Associate Professor of Orthopedics, SCB Medical College, Qatar. He is Secretary of the Odisha Orthopedic Association, East Zone Regional Orthopedic Forum, and Coordinator of the present CMA, Dr. N.C. Mahapatra. So thank you, sir. Respected Chairman, viewers in the audience, uh, auditorium, and uh, my teachers and friends. So I'll be sharing some of my experience with floating shoulder injuries. These are very complex injuries and uh, needs due attention and care. Uh, so I'll start with some case discussion. This is Mr. Chandrasekhar. He presented with a very unstable shoulder injury with a fractured scapula and clavicle. And uh, this is the X-ray for evaluation. Then we planned a surgery for him. This is the posterior picture. And this is the function after three months, almost a full range of movement. Next case, Mr. B.K. Saha, an old man, he never agreed for surgery. He had a very severe complex injury with gross displacement. Even after six months, the clavicle didn't unite. And uh, the function, he never gained any good function. Still, he is not, uh, not ready for surgery. Uh, this is another young man who had an unstable fracture of the scapula and uh, uh, clavicle with a floating shoulder injuries. He also didn't agree for surgery. It's almost uh, eight months after the fracture united, but he never gained a full abduction. Then uh, Mr. Surjit Singh, who visited our place uh, from Punjab, he presented to us with a, a mild pain in the shoulder and little stiffness. When I did x-ray and I told him, uh, that he had a very severe floating shoulder injury and may need a surgery, he was uh, surprised and thought I had gone mad because, uh, sorry, because he had almost a full range of movement without any surgery. It was only six weeks old. So, uh, these uh, floating shoulder injuries may behave in bizarre pattern. So, the moral out of this, the outcome in floating shoulder injury is always unpredictable and a proper evaluation and judgment is essential for a proper uh, uh, decision. So decision making is very, very important in this type of injuries. So what is a floating shoulder injury? Floating shoulder is frequently defined as an epsilateral fracture of the clavicle and scapular neck. But the definition continues to evolve with our growing understanding of the role of ligaments in maintain maintaining the stability of the shoulder girdle. Ligament disruption associated with a scapular neck fracture can contribute to the functional equivalent of this injury pattern with or without any associated clavicle fracture. This should be kept in mind. So shoulder is a joint complex which is attached loosely to the axial skeleton but has some of the strong ligaments. Gauss gave us this concept of su superior shoulder sus suspensory complex which helps maintain a stable relationship between the axial skeleton and the upper extremity. This superior shoulder suspensory complex is a fibro-osseous ring. The ring includes the glenoid process, coracoid, coracoclavicular ligament, distal clavicle, and the acromion process. And the superior strut is the middle third of the clavicle, and inferior strut is the lateral scapular body of the spine. And this is important to understand because any single break in the uh, SSSC is stable injury and doesn't need any treatment like surgical care and heal well. But if it, there is a double break in SSSC, like we see in pictures, so uh, they usually unstable and may pose problem for uh, recovery of the shoulder function. So may need uh, active care. So to understand what are the patterns of injury that can occur in the scapula or uh, floating shoulder injury, the primary fracture line is almost always in the glenoid neck uh, going towards the uh, medial aspect of the 
coracoid process. Then there are second, secondary fracture lines, this may be osseous, where there is a fracture of clavicle or a fracture of acromion, and this again will lead to um, uh, unstable shoulder, floating shoulder injury. Or it may be uh, affected uh, to the ligaments, there may be rupture of ligaments, or there may be com combination osseous and uh, ligamentous injury, which may lead to a floating shoulder injury. Once this injury occurs, uh, in a floating shoulder, the biomechanics of shoulder change because of gravity, weight of the arm, or on a post muscle pole, uh, the glenoid is displaced anteromedially, and there is a, a loss of rotator cuff lever arm. So it leads to drooping of shoulder, subacromial pain, malunion, nonunion, post traumatic arthritis, and most important, brachial plexopathy, leading to pro, uh, neuro, neurological problems. So, how to evaluate this? Patients. Clinical evaluation is very important and uh, it should be on the ATLS protocol because they are always complex injury and needs high energy trauma. And almost 80 to 90 percent of cases they are associated with major life threatening and other injuries like thoracic injury, head injury, and uh, other neurovascular problems. Then, besides the chest x ray to rule out uh, the lungs injury, or, uh, then we must do a proper evaluation of shoulder injuries by trauma series x-ray, AP, axillary and y view. From this x-ray we can draw many lines like glenopular angle and other glenoidal inclination which will give us an idea about uh, whether, uh, whether the fracture is stable or unstable so that you can uh, plan out the future course of action. And then we can do a CT scan for evaluation for accurate assessment of articular step off any displacement, combination, etc. And a 3D CT evaluation is a must because they are very important to identify a displacement, angulation, and fracture pattern. We can rotate the CT to uh, bring it to proper plane so that we can draw a glenopular angle and uh, mediolateral displacement, which will suggest stability of the fracture. There are few evidence-based study about, about the uh, outcome of these floating shoulder injuries and uh, though there are some studies very few uh, due to lack of adequate number of cases, high variability between studies, use of different non-validated and non-specific outcome measures, high incidence of additional injuries uh, like head and chest injuries, a valid comparison may not be possible for operative and non-operative treatment of different fracture types. So what is the treatment option? Uh, first is non-surgical. Are the pros, these are non-invasive in nature, low morbidity, is avoid potential risk of surgery, cons, uh, there is concern about complications like abductor weakness and uh, non-anatomic reductions, less of function. Uh, Non-surgical method requires a period of immobilization and pain management followed by supervised physiotherapy. Non-operation does not mean complacency, they have to be taken proper care. In most cases, most studies say non-surgical management results in satisfactory outcome. So this is some of the study, this is some of the largest study, uh, even there are some studies where only two cases, four cases has been reported and most of the cases uh, say good but a small number of cases, they lack control and basically a retrospective study. Then coming to surgical management, our advantage is they restore immediate structural stability to, to shoulder. They prevent muscle imbalance around the shoulder and prevent long-term complications. Cons, surgical morbidity, blood loss, and tissue trauma. So we have two options in surgery. We may go for limited uh, surgery or fixation of clavicle or go for radical surgery for fixation of clavicle and glenoid. These are some of the studies. Again, there is no in informality of study. There is a lack of control and small number of uh, cases. So. We take first about the limited surgery by fixation clavicle. This is a very easy operation, can be done by anybody. This is sufficient to prevent malrotation and displacement of glenoid and it, it or, or restore the normal solar contour and only comes if there is gross instability or intraarticular fracture, they, they, can, they will not be sufficient. So coming for radical surgery of clavicle and glenoid, pros they restore the structural integrity and rapid rehabilitation and restoration of function. Comes 
in increased surgical time because of you have to do two major surgeries in front and back, tissue trauma, blood loss and post-operative pain. There are certain indications if there is a gross instability, this should be attempted. Uh, some of the pointers to gross instability, if the glenoid is medialized more than 30 mm, displacement of clavicle 10 mm, and glenofular angle more than uh, less than 20 degree, this suggests gross instability with ligament and bone injury, so should be attempted this way. Under no conservative care or even with fixation of clavicle only, this type of displaced fracture can be corrected and uh, corrected and reduced. So let us see one of these cases, Rajesh, a 20 year uh, male having this gross, unstable, uh, floating shoulder injuries, the CT uh, 3D, with 3D construction, we did a open reduction um, and fixation and this is after three months uh, almost uh, he has a normal range of movement. So to conclude, uh, one must decide which factors may influence outcome by proper evaluation and then approach each patient on individual basis like the first four cases we saw. So this depends the factors uh, depend on pathoanatomy of a floating shoulder specific injury pattern, patient condition and associated injuries like head and uh, chest injuries, clinical appearance of the shoulder and a proper thorough um, radiologic evaluation. This is very important for a proper decision making. So what is the take home message? Any floating shoulder injury comes, one must realize they are very complex injuries. So they should be evaluated in ATLS protocol and then a thorough clinical and radiologic evaluation should be done to assess if there are stable injuries and many many displaced and no uh, interligamentous inter instability then they can be managed conservatively. But if unstable some type of surgery is essential to restore the shoulder function and in a limited way we can go for a fixation clavicle but if you do that we must for operative fluoroscopically evaluate to see the stability. If unstable we must go for uh, fixation of the clavicle and glenoid, uh, glenoid uh, of the scapula. Thank you. Thank you Dr. Mahapatra. Could you come on to the dais for the discussion? Now the trauma session is open for discussion. We have uh, 10 minutes for questions. May I invite questions from the audience, please? Hello. So my question to Dr. Dean Dayan, please. Yeah. Uh, sir, a comment on role of hydrogen peroxide and betadine along with normal saline in primary and subsequent wound wash, should they be used? And what is the exact right amount of normal saline that should be used in compound injuries as the rule of 3, 6 and 9 liters is not being followed? So what is the right amount, just the right amount? <coughs> So, uh, the irrigation part of it, if you look, up to 6 liters you can definitely use. Whereas when you take betadine and uh, hydrogen peroxide, it has been found to be of any, is of no value because the betadine, they say that it can also injure the tissues. So, that is why it is of, uh, found to be of no value. And peroxide? Hydrogen peroxide also like... Yeah. Recently, we had a symposium by, given by Peter Bates. He said it is of no use except that it uh, gives you a feel of uh, having a good feeling that it has formed a foam into the tissue, but it does not do anything else. So, people suggest that we should use only normal saline. What do you say, sir? Normal saline we do use because uh, we, it helps us to wash a little bit of uh, whatever the debraided material is there. We can clean it up at the end. So can we spare betadine and peroxide for subsequent? Times. We don't use betadine and hydrogen peroxide. Okay. If, if you see the betadine, you know, my remarks are if you see the betadine, the company doesn't recommend betadine for use inside the body. It is for external use only. Yeah. So question it is only recommended for external use, not internal use. My question to Santaram may, sir. May I request you to give your introduction before asking the question? I am Dr. Mahapadra from Mumbai. Uh, my question to Santaram sir, when you get an intra-articular fractures. Can you have cordless? Yes, yes. Santaram sir, I Please. am from, I am Dr. Mahapatra from Mumbai. Yes. My question is, when you get an intra-articular fractures, usually we do first span it, then scan it, then plan it. You have never mentioned about putting an external fixator. 
I, 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 I think I emphasized and re-emphasized and I showed four examples of an external fixator being put and then on the fifth day we, of the sixth day we went and fixed the fracture. I showed four examples, <laughs> not one. So so my so question so is to Dr. Dean Dhyalan. Uh, Dr. Deen Dhyalan, uh, you introduce yourself, in your, I am Dr. Ravi Gupta from Chandigarh. Yes. Uh, there was uh, no mention about the Gustlo Anderson classification in open fractures. Does it mean that Gustlo Anderson is out now? And as I understood that Ganga score is basically meant for mangled limbs rather than open fractures. So does it more applicable to open fractures than Gustlo Anderson? Could you have some cordless mics, please? Unfortunately, the time period is the one that we can't cover all of these things. But one thing is, Gustilo Anderson is a medium of communication. Like, when, when somebody speaks to uh, everyone, that everybody will understand. Gustilo 3 means everybody will understand what they are meaning into it. But more the severity of the injury, that is grade 3B yeah. injuries yes. when you get, which where you want to decide about an amputation and salvage. So that's the mangled yeah, limb. Yeah, it? that is. Then uh, Ganga hospital score is very useful, but that does not mean it is only for that. Even the other injuries, if you score, the total score, if it is less than 8, it will let you know that we can do all the, uh, like even the coverage we can do on the day 1. Whereas up to 9 and above, you will have to stage it. This type of uh, uh, cl clarification also will give you in these open injuries. That is the advantage of Ganga hospital score. And then you never mentioned about the antibiotics, the role of antibiotics during which period if you use they are the best role and then which kind of antibiotic? The broad spectrum antibiotics that we use is uh, Supercept, that is Kefiroxim sodium and of course if there is any further contamination that we expect we also add amino glycoside into it. So otherwise the commonly used is the Kefiroxim sodium. Sir, we have a lecture on antibiotic therapy in the afternoon. So please, really? to the sir, any question for uh, Professor no. Dean Dayalan, no. please. No. Sir, any third piece in tibia, triangular piece, whether it is totally free and minimally attached, should be removed? S sorry? Any triangular piece in tibia, triangular piece in tibia, which is free no. or minimally attached in open compound fractures, should it be removed? Sir? No, it depends on at dangling tibia. Butterfly it's fragment is asked. Soft tissue and the vascular. Butterfly fragment. Butterfly no. fragment, if it, if it is uh, totally free or minimally attached to soft tissue, should it be removed? So yeah, whenever there is a butterfly fragment without any soft tissue attachment, then I, what I do is I keep them, keep it till I put the X fix so that it will help me to know the angulation, length, and axis you would get it. At the end of the fixation, I will remove the butterfly fragment that is without any soft tissues. Sir, we Secondarily, I can go ahead and do a bone grafting. Sir, we have found sometimes it is incorporated, sometimes it is not. No, that depends on the involvement of the attachment of the soft tissue. Suppose if it is very small, probably it can survive. But if it is bigger, for example, if it is probably I would say that one and a half inch or so, then it may not survive. So, it, the length, uh, length of the fragment also will matter in those instances. Uh, question for Professor Tinde Allen, please. Uh, congratulations, it was a most comprehensive and complete lecture. I have a small comment to make about units and surgeons who are not as busy as yours. There is a role for mono treatment using the Elizaro fixator. Essentially your treatment consisted of multiple surgeries done in, done in stages like initial fixation then conversion to internal fixation etc. I just wanted to point out that there is still a role for the Elizaro fixator as a treatment from the beginning till the end. It can be modified to accommodate the flaps and it can easily be converted into the bone transport techniques. It differs from unit to unit but it has a tremendous role in compound fractures. Thank you. The Elizero definitely has got its role. Probably the time limit makes us not to inc incorporate all the fixation methods. Question to yes. Dr. Dindayalan. After the primary assault, uh, what are the subjective criteria when you can go in for the second assault <laughs> surgery? What we they generally look into is, is uh, whether it is a part of a polytrauma or not first and then the uh, amount of local soft tissue impact. So as I said, if there is a two area of wound, 
and then the single fracture then there would be a sub so deep loving in, in between the two wounds or if there is a small wound but if there is a two fracture again it is also a problem so in these instances you must always aim to have something like an external fixator in the beginning whereas if there is a wound as well as the fracture in a local area which will not be having any deep load area then probably yes you can you can do all the all of them together in a day one I wanted to ask whether any subjective criteria for going in for surgery, even in a polytrauma after the first assault. Yes, polytrauma like for, uh, the, he must have been completely resuscitated. That means the lactate levels must be normalized, less than 2 millimoles. Then that means the patient is completely uh, resuscitated. And then the anesthetist must say that he is fit enough. So that is also one of the important parameters that you need to consider. Once the research station means there are many factors like hemodynamically patient may be stable but the lactate level that is the hypoxia inside the body may be less that is what is indicated by the lactate levels if that becomes normalized then patient is resuscitated completely when the biochemical markers are the one which tell you to do it either on day one or later sir but my question to professor dean the sir so i mean is there any specific protocol for choice of antibiotics i mean uh, at, the, at the i think this has been discussed may, may i call out the next speaker next sir, question sir, Deem is, there, is interleukin 6 which is a marker for the is done very oftenly at your center interleukin 6 we always do because all the patients get it done and that also lets us know whether we can stage the fracture or not we always do that interleukin no, 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 yeah. Is it very reliable than lactate? Is it? No, lactate mm -hmm. is the one which indicates to you about your uh, resuscitation levels. Whereas the interleukin is the one which is going to tell about the syndromic involvement. That is whether the other systems are also in involved or not. All those things will let you know in that. Hello. Sir, uh, may I ask one question? Okay. Okay. Hello. Okay. May I have the first mic on this side, please? Dr. Tudu. Yeah. Uh, my question to one second, please, sir. Uh, my yeah. question to Professor Sethi. Yes, yes. Uh, intraarticular fractures of uh, tibia, yeah. particularly Saska type 3, yes. we encounter a lot of uh, association of uh, compartmental syndrome. What is your protocol in this case? That's why I emphasize the role of uh, assessment and soft tissue assessment. If, if you think it cannot be done immediately, you will have to put an external fixator, wait till all the soft tissues really settle down and then do a uh, definitive procedure. Type 3 you will have to elevate and graft it. Whether you will and go for uh, immediate uh, fasciotomy or not? Immediate? Fasciotomy. Fasciotomy, it depends on uh, from patient to patient. If you assess the patient carefully and if it requires a fasciotomy, it has to be done as an emergency. You shall not wait. It has to be done immediately. Thank you. Now may I ask uh, questions to yes, Dr. Sen. Dr. Sen. Uh, what is the role of uh, primary arthroplasty now in acetabular fractures? Uh, regarding acetabular fracture, we have got a condition where we have got excessive comminution of the femur head the excessive combination on the estimate side where the reconstruction is not possible in an individual who is uh, osteoporotic to a level where we cannot really restore the normalcy and this is probably the condition when we can consider that as an option it is now being increasingly employed that in this kind of a situation we will have to stabilize the columns of the estabulum and then to use the femur head as a graft to fill up the uh, spaces left and then to replace the joint. But it is restricted right now, though it is being increasingly considered as an option. Okay. Thank you, sir. Before we close the session, one last question for Professor Mohanty, because he has... <laughs> uh, in, in a young patient with a gap non-union of uh, fracture neck femur, how do you assess the avascular necrosis of the head of the femur? The vascularity of the head of the tumor. You can tell your question. Yeah. So I want to ask one question. One, I, immediately after this.
you want to know about the vascular necrosis of the head of the femur. So you see, normally, you, what you go, you can have all the all these investigations of CT scan, MRI, and nuclear scan, and all this. So most of the time, we don't go that further. We usually assess by the density and the trabecular pattern of the head of the femur by a simple, good quality Excel. Okay. Thank you, sir. I think time is over. We have to close the session. So before we close the session, he wants one last question. Last question. Uh, is there uh, any added advantage of the uh, this rail fixator over the tubular fixator? Can it be used as a definitive uh, treatment in a compound treatment? He is asking you. Could you repeat your question, please? Is there the any over advantage of the rail fixator? To a tubular fixator. Over, over tubular fixator yeah, and yeah, can it be used as the definitive treatment? No, there is, uh, the principle is the same. It does not matter. It depends on our experience and the practice that we have done. So I always use a monorail technique, whereas there are people who just use a uh, Elizabeth fix. It is only our experience and the technique over which we have learned over. So it, is, it does not make any difference as far as uh, regeneration of the bone or reconstructive method is concerned. What you are good at. Yeah, it is only that what you are good at, you have to use it. I think we can continue the discussion yeah. later on. We have to close the session. Before I close, may I have the pleasure of presenting a small memento on behalf of the organizing committee to all the speakers. And I could request Dr. Rajiv Gupta for mementos to our chairpersons for their role and running the session very beautifully for Dr. S.S. Mahanti and Dr. A.K. Vashnay. Our train has been running in time. I think we are doing a good job. The hall seems to be full. And I am reasonably sure that everybody is quite satisfied with what is being dished out in the academic fair. Dr. Tana, who had been late, is now in and he will be speaking first in the next session. So I think people are not going to shift out of here. And for the next session, that is decision making in sports injury, our next chairpersons, Dr. B. K. Beharia and Dr. P. M. Gadre, can I please invite you to the stage, sir? Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's very nice. And uh, I'm thankful to Dr. Tanna for coming in. And uh, let us start the session uh, of the sports injuries uh, with uh, inviting Professor Tanna to come and speak. Uh, I wish to just highlight Dr. Tanna. He's a retired professor at Nair Hospital. Now he is working as a consultant. He was. Also, uh, he is also working at Jaslok, Bhatia and Saivi hospitals in Bombay. He is actively involved in teaching, uh, mainly the orth orthopedic surgeons now, all over the world. I think everybody knows Tanna Nail introduced by him, and uh, which started <coughs> interlocking nails in India. He is considered father of interlocking nails in India, and he has contributed many <coughs> chapters in different books and published many papers. I am sure most of us are very familiar with him. Dr. Tanna, please. <clears throat> Decision making in shattered diaphysian fractures of the long bone.
Shattered diaphysis fracture is an uncommon entity. Small series or a case reports by one surgeon is a rule rather than an exception. I do not think any one of us have got a case like this second case. This is the case. Aim is always to get back full pre-injury function in the shortest time. Realistic expectation is the functional result in a one year time because this fracture takes a very long time to become all right. This is, a, this is I think a unique fracture which has been reported by Devdas and the group in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery British Edition. So you can imagine such a shattered fracture is a case report which could be accepted in a bone and joint surgery. This is the one which ultimately ended up into a good union, good alignment and everything. So axis maintain, length maintain, that is the function of the shattered fracture which you get. If at all any comment, there is a minor recurvatum, but an excellent result of a fracture like this, which otherwise is almost impossible to treat in any conventional ways. The problem? This is the 30-year-old, 38-year-old fresh accident. Planning, do not think of shortening the bone to get a healing. That is the prime situation. If you are seeing the patient for the first time, do not think of shortening to get the healing. Take the length of the normal leg, distract the fracture till this length, and then fix up the implant, whatever you feel is suitable. The implants, as all of us know, either it is a nail, or it is a plate. And in such a shattered fracture, I feel this particular piece which is turned, which you can see it over here with the arrow shows, do not try to unturn it at the first sitting. Because I feel this is a fracture which is going to take a long time. You will almost always need a bone grafting. And hence, nail it and keep it in alignment, keep the axis, keep the length, and that is the only motto which we have for that. Close nailing, the length maintain, nail trading only the major piece and the rotated fragment is not touched. Go ahead, what is the prognosis of this fully rotated piece? There is no immediate relocation. Wait for six to eight weeks. Into six to eight weeks at the time of a primary, at the time of a bone grafting. Bone grafting is, I would say, not indicated on day one because whatever is the healing potentials of this fracture should not be disturbed on day one. The early grafting in two months time later, while doing the grafting, I relocated this piece, did the grafting, the, the piece was relocated and grafted in 18 months and, to, and this is the one which takes a long time to heal up as we know this is at the end of 18 months. Due to fragments away from each other, always there is a slow healing. Is this expected? Yes. Whether it needs a relocation, that is not proved because there are many reports which suggest even if it is not relocated, this fracture can heal up. Reloc I feel the relocating will help. My gut feeling is at the time of grafting, it is a short to relocate it and you will have a better chance of healing because the bone to bone contact is going to be there. And you must do a planned grafting. Do not wait for the fracture to have a non-union. Relocate after six weeks at the time of grafting, may not get enough autograft and hence autograft plus allograft is a rule. And you can see here in 24 months time, patient has a good axis, good length, walking about and full limb mobile joint because you can start mobilizing almost on day one non-weight bearing mobilization. You will be rewarded, ultimately walking full weight bearing. Or here you plan such a combinated fracture, if there is a fracture which is there like this, again do not think of shortening, do a close nailing, close nailing was done, the few fragments which have been turned, just do nothing, go down after about combinated fracture, nailing distraction to maintain the length and then graft second stage and you can get a perfect healing, perfect axis establishment, no shortening or anything. If you try to shorten, it's going to be a long procedure with Alizara to re regain the length which is not required in, a, in this case. 
This was a patient, 55 year old, fresh injury. Nailing or plating, I had planned for a nailing. I went down, I started with the nailing on the fracture table. And this is the picture after reduction. This is what I got after reduction. Many pieces, comminuted piece. And I, at that time, I decided I shall not do a nailing because I felt this was probably not suitable for nailing. It will not be a stability. And hence I went ahead and did the plating. The longest available synthesis plate which was available locking plate, I used it. And you can see, for such a fracture, this plate is short. I shouldn't have used this plate, but having not planned, this was the longest plate which I used. I did the leg screws, and you can see the plate gave way. It is no way in which this fracture is going to heal up. Five months, I went ahead and did a blade plate in a good position, and ultimately you can see in six months time, without any shortening, the whole thing has healed up. It could have been on day one, while I missed out of skipping this long blade plate. Long neutralizing 95 degree blade plate, I did not keep it. I did not keep it because I thought it was not required. So planning is very important. Keep the things whatever may be required at that stage. Long such plate is also not readily available. Even with the synthesis, they do not have such a long plate. I keep it in stock in my clinic for this unevent, um, uneventful situations. But unfortunately, I didn't plan to plate it fully. I planned only for nailing. I relied on a long, a thick locking plate. And I wish I had kept this 95 degree plate because that is the best neutralization you can do for this. These are the two almost similar cases. Nailing took a long time and a multiple graft which had to be done. Plating will probably give you better alignment and early healing. And I feel that you must plan it out in a case like this because this is an unusual situation which you are going to get. Here was a compound fracture. Compound fracture again did the debridement. Didn't rely on shortening the bone, kept the bone distracted. You can see the bone is distracted out. The fibula is there position. The tibia which needs to be debrided had was de debrided out. Ultimately, a lizard house, segment transport, and you get the perfect healing. Good bone to bone contact, the grafting and the flaps and everything can be done with this nail. And that is the reason I feel, do not shorten. Go ahead all out, do everything. If you do not get an infection, it's very easy to treat. And that's the reason why the debriment is the most important part. Debrid it fully and you will be rewarded. This is again a shattered bone. This was my hospital attendant, 39 year old, injury in village, seven days back. And by the time he could come in a just look seven star hospital, he arrived seven days after the injury. He was working there with a pouring pus and toxemia. Such a shattered bone. All which we could do on day one was debris day daily for five days till clean. And again the purpose was to get the healing. Aliza Rao started segment transport, see the old loose fragment, everything was there. After many surgeries and the lo losing sleep, this is the final result. Because I feel he went through a stormy event. If it is a seven days old infected, it needs a much more discipline action and fortunately for the Jaslok hospital which was really standing behind him he could be handled there and ultimately at the end of about two and a half years he could get a full healing of this fracture but ultimately ended up on a shortening because he was going through the whole stormy period it ended up into a so much of shortening six centimeters short he wears a footwear and cover over it and works in the operation theater for last 13 years he is walking about. As you can see, he is walking about, moving about very well. And he walks about with such a short leg, but he can move about and walk about and work. He is back in my OT with six centimeter shoes. Me and he both have refused temptation of correcting the length for last 13 years. Because he went through a very stormy period, almost at the, at the mouth of a death. And that's the reason we both have taken a vow. We shall not change our decision. These are the such a badly shattered fractures, compound fractures, where you will have to go ahead and do the debriment 
either primarily or secondarily. Do not keep these bones with the hope that you will get the bone which is going to be there. Such compound fractures, if you try to keep the bone, it's never going to work. Do not try to thread them. This is going to be a disaster. So do the debriment on day one if it is a compound fracture. And such a fracture which ultimately heals up, you such a compound fracture, if you have a, such a mal position, you will have to go down on the six weeks and do it. Do not hope that this is going to heal up. This is nine months, it has gone into non-union. And these are the shattered bones. Ultimately, when the infection and everything is controlled, you can go down, do a plating with intramedullary fibula, and ultimately the fracture heals up. And these are the fractures I feel you must be treating them all the time. Every fracture is a different fracture. In conclusion, shattered diaphyseal bones do not shorten if possible. Fill up the gaps with bone grafts. I feel plate gives a better alignment and axis correction. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Dr. Tanmay Mahanti, who is a known orthopedic surgeon from Odisha. He, he has agreed to deliver the talk on ankle instability. Dr. Mahanti. And he has also he has been selected for Susrut Award of IOA this year. Chairman Sir, my senior teachers, delegates and friends. I have been assigned this job to discuss about the ankle instability, decision making in a sports injury. Dr. Rajiv would have been talking about it, so people are waiting to listen to him. Let us just discuss how we are going to handle a case of ankle instability following sports. In short, if you look at it, most of the ankle disability occurs due to ligament injuries. But sometimes we get paralytic conditions like polio, leprosy, which is very common here. And sometimes after fractures around the ankle, you can have malunion or any gap between the malleoli, which finally leads to some ligament laxity along with that. So thinking about the disability in ankle due to laxity, when we study the ankle's anatomy, we find that it is only the bones, tibia, fibula, and talus. Below that, the calcaneus and the foot in front. To go. And what we are thinking that, in hip, we have some muscles which cross over the joint, bold muscles. But when it comes to a knee, few muscles cover the knee, and we depend mostly on the collaterals. And when it comes to ankle, you don't virtually see any muscle. You only see ligaments which come from the fibula to the calcaneus and sometimes the, 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 on the medial aspect you get the deltoid ligament which is very strong but you only see bones and ligaments and the body takes maximum weight on the ankle. So when there is an injury to the ankle we always consider that ligament injuries around ankle are the most common. They are more serious than muscle injuries because when the torn ligaments occur they do not regenerate, but they heal by scar. Since ligaments stabilize the joints, injury really can cause a lot of instability. And chronic instability is a common condition for which it restricts the activities in most of the active people who are in sports. So in short, we can just remember what is a sprain. A common man knows what is a sprain. We tell it is a common sprain, it is a very minor ligamentous injury you find stretching of the ligament with small tears along that. And on the other side is complete disruption of the ligaments or ligament, which is called a type 3 sprain. Middle, you find that incomplete ligamentous injuries. So when we read about the anatomy, we see the medial aspect, that is the deltoid ligament. It has the anterior part, middle part and the posterior part. Very uncommon to have injuries because mostly when a sportsman gets an injury, it is a stretch on the anterolateral aspect of the ankle. So when we look at the lateral aspect of the ankle, we see the anterior talo fibular ligament. And 
another ligament which is the calcaneofibular ligament i try to give stress on calcaneofibular ligament uh, calcaneofibular ligament because it is only ligament which is outside the capsule on the lateral aspect and mostly when it needs to be repaired you have to go for open not by arthroscopic so when you look at a lady coming to you with a bruise on the anterior aspect anterior lateral aspect of the the moment orthopedic surgeons like you look at it with a history of injury then you suspect it is a sprain and the moment the she tells that i am having pain in this region with after the injury your diagnosis to some extent is correct that it is a sprain of the ankle and when you try to invert the foot she will have pain on that region that means the anterolateral ligaments have gone into a tear maybe partial or complete still now we don't know whether it is complete or not the moment we invert maybe we can find that the talus we tilt and then we can think of a stress x ray normally we do not go for stress x rays unless it is really necessary because by giving a stress when the ankle goes into that position it is quite painful and sometimes you have to give a little bit of anesthesia so ultrasound examination really helps sometimes even it is a customary in a good hospital who treats sports injuries to have good ultrasound examination of these people and even sometimes it is advocated that ultrasound examination thing has to be kept on the side of the field when a major games is going on looking at the mri if we are patient is quite affordable obviously mri can give us the condition about the ligaments as for the theory arthrography was one of the methods by which one can know the injuries to the ligaments and injury to the joints itself but it will be easier nowadays as we are going for arthroscopy so once your patient really getting a injury to the ankle and if you see a complete disruption possibly you will think it is a major thing let me wait how it is going to heal but in a acute sprain a common person knows now the treatment of rice if you go into the internet ask a school boy also they will tell that rice means rest ice or cold compression nowadays everybody is using sprays also then compression what we give by crepe bandages and then elevation of the limb really it relieves the throbbing pain everything once we give it in acute sprain we expect it to, to heal then one can think of giving air braces or any type of brace which will not allow another episode of instability in the ankle leading to the sprain becoming more difficult to treat but in indian condition we find that our patients will not cooperate and sometimes they will remove the brace and test whether the ligament is healing or not it is better to put on a cast i think most of the orthopedic surgeons here will accept that they prefer a cast to give for about 3 weeks so that the soft tissues will heal as far as possible and the patient can walk around by third or fourth day when the edema goes away and really they need a gross physiotherapy the physiotherapy which has to be done with supervision proper supervision which normally people avoid but in a sports man or a sports woman it is really necessary to come back with the strength and the confidence has to come back later when we look at a fracture like this or a ankle injury the person comes to you the moments they see an x ray that there is a fracture obviously they bother but as a orthopedic surgeon you it will come to your mind is it safe i think most of the orthopedic surgeon you will try to explain to the patient you are lucky you have got fractures because i can treat the fractures and i can make you nearly coming back to nearly normal position but in case it is a sprain possibly it would have been more difficult for you to come back to normal that's why in our terms we tell it is better to break the ankle than to sprain it so when it comes to our idea sometimes looking at sportsmen having injuries it was my misfortune to treat and i was present during the match in katak in barawati stadium between india and zimbabwe mr binod kamli he was playing there just after lunch in a full stomach he was feeling and died and finally the leg came with this the moment you look at it you will be thinking what will happen to this man's foot who is a avid cricketer you get an x ray and you see there is a peritala dislocation the whole foot has gone away at the ankle just below the talus any orthopedic surgeon will look at this will think possibly everything is lost immediately unless i stabilize this joint something will happen in katak at that moment mri was not available 
the only thing that we gave him GA immediately in short GA we could reduce that it was not difficult gave him a baloney slab immediately transported him to Bombay the next day where proper treatment was given I was really skeptical I didn't know what was to be done and if he loses any type of problem he has any problem in the ankle obviously I'll be responsible about two years after I found him he went back to Baravati Stadium I just asked him